providing free legal assistance to parties involved in peace negotiations, drafting post-conflict constitutions, war crimes prosecution, transitional justice, and human rights documentation. Women's involvement in rebuilding and repairing the consequences of conflict is paramount for a just transition as they're often the ones who bear the biggest brunt of conflict. The lack of attention and impunity for sexual and gender-based crimes are fundamental obstacles to sustainable transitional justice efforts. As such, the insufficient role of women in transitional justice is a topic that requires urgent attention from practitioners and academics in the field of international relations and international law. During this roundtable, we will discuss the challenges women face during and after conflict and the role they play in truth, reconciliation, healing, justice, and political transformation. Our panelists will share insights on the gaps in transitional justice processes around the globe, the effective engagement of women's perspectives in transitional justice processes, and the protection of women's rights in transitional justice. The roundtable will be 60 minutes long. Our esteemed panelists include Jacqueline Nasiwa, who we hope will be able to join us very shortly from Juba, South Sudan, Patricia Sellers, Dr. Priya Pillay, Pinky Mehta, Dr. Katerina Busol, and Professor Valerie Oosterveld. We ask that you please submit any questions you have for our speakers using the Q&A function, and we will do our best to answer your questions at the end of this event. Now, allow me just a few minutes to introduce our panelists. Today, we're honored to welcome Dr. Priya Pillay, a lawyer and international law specialist with two decades of expertise in the areas of international justice, international human rights, transitional justice, peace and conflict, and humanitarian issues. Priya has worked at the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies and the United Nations International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. She has been involved in different aspects of peace and transitional justice initiatives in South and Southeast Asia. Next, we have Patricia Sellers, an international criminal lawyer. She's the special advisor for slavery crimes for the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court and was previously the special advisor for gender for the office of the former prosecutor, Fatou Bensouda. Patty is a visiting fellow at Kellogg College of the University of Oxford, a practicing professor at the London School of Economics, and a senior research fellow at the Human Rights Center of the University of California, Berkeley. Finally, Patty served as the legal advisor for gender, acting head of the legal advisory section and a prosecutor at the Yugoslavia Tribunal from 1994 to 2007. We are also hoping to be joined by Jacqueline Nasiwa, Senior Peace Fellow at the Public International Law and Policy Group and the National Director for the Center for Inclusive Governance, Peace and Justice. Jacqueline is a member of the Technical Committee appointed by the Ministry of Justice and Constitutional Affairs of South Sudan to facilitate public consultations in the process to develop legislation for the Commission for Truth, Reconciliation and Healing. She's also the chairperson of the National Alliance of Women Lawyers of South Sudan. Welcome also to Professor Valerie Oosterveld, a professor at Western University's Faculty of Law in Canada. Her research and writing focus on gender issues within international criminal justice. She has published widely on the subject of the investigation and prosecution of sexual and gender-based violence as genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Her co-edited book, Gender and International Criminal Law, will be published later this month by Oxford University Press. She's a member of the Canadian Partnership for International Justice and is the Associate Director of Western University Center for Transitional Justice and Post-Conflict Reconstruction. We also have with us Dr. Katerina Busol, a Ukrainian lawyer specializing in international humanitarian and criminal law, transitional justice, gender, and cultural heritage. She's a senior lecturer at the National University of Kyiv Mohila Academy, Ukraine, a fellow of the Leibniz Institute for East and Southeast European Studies, Germany, and an academy associate at Chatham House in the United Kingdom. Katerina is also the founder of the International Law Talks and a board member of the Cambridge Society of Ukraine, which enhances educational opportunities for Ukrainian children. And welcome to Pinky Meta, an associate in the Washington DC office of Milbank and a member of the firm's Transportation and Space Group and Global Risk and National Security Practice. Pinky supports PLPG's work in South Sudan and is helping to author a handbook on women's inclusion in transitional justice. 
You can view full panelist biographies on the PILPG website and in the links shared with you in the chat. Welcome everyone, and thank you for agreeing to participate in today's panel. Let me start with Valerie. Valerie, what do we mean when we talk about women's inclusion and transitional justice? What exactly is transitional justice and why is women's inclusion in transitional justice processes such an important topic to focus in the context of accountability? Thank you very much, Milena. And your question essentially has two parts. First of all, what is transitional justice? And secondly, why is it important that women are included in transitional justice? So I'll begin first with what transitional justice is. And I like to use the definition from the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, which is that transi transitional justice covers the full range of processes and mechanisms associated with society's attempt to come to terms with a legacy of large scale past conflict, repression, violations and abuses in order to ensure accountability, serve justice and achieve reconciliation. And what they mean by that is that these, there are many different processes which include judicial and non-judicial measures, um, truth seeking measures, prosecution initiatives, reparations and other steps to prevent the recurrence of new violations, including constitutional, legal, and institutional reform, strengthening of civil society, memorialization efforts, cultural initiatives, preserving archives, and the reform of education in order to provide recognition to victims, enhance the trust of individuals in state institutions, reinforce respect for human rights and promote the rule of law and taking steps towards the prevention of new violations. Now, on the question of why women should be included in transitional justice processes, transitional justice is meant to help address grievances and divisions in society. So transitional justice processes need to be context specific, nationally owned and focused on the needs of victims to contribute in a meaningful way to lasting peace. So if women and girls weren't involved, then the transitional justice mechanisms won't provide full justice for all members of society. So what does this mean in practice? It means that women and girls need to be involved in transitional justice in various ways. They need to be at the table in ceasefire and peace negotiations. They need to be leading and contributing to truth commissions and accountability mechanisms like courts and tribunals. They need to be present in legislative reform and they need to be involved in decisions on reparations and memorialization of atrocities. Now, many of the people on this call will know that over two decades ago, the UN Security Council adopted a resolution number 1325 that recognized the importance of the equal participation of women in all efforts to promote peace and security. And also in 2019, the UN Security Council adopted a resolution specifically calling for women's meaningful participation in transitional justice processes. UN Women and the UNDP recently published this year a really wonderful study that I commend to all of you called Women's Meaningful Participation in Transitional Justice, Advancing Gender Equality and Building Sustainable Peace. And I'll end by highlighting a few points that they raise to answer the question that you've asked me, Milena, which is that accommodating women's intersectionality is essential in transitional justice and women's meaningful participation must grapple with male power structures that are inherent in the societies that had collapsed into conflict or mass atrocity, that women's meaningful participation in transitional justice needs to take place before, during, and after implementation of transitional justice processes, that transitional justice needs to be grounded in local women and their needs and priorities, and lastly, that transitional justice needs to cultivate public buy-in and plan for pushback against women's involvement. And I'll end here. Thank you, Valerie. And I'm sure we'll have time to return to some of these points. Um, 
I'm going to go to Priya next. Priya, we've heard that conflict can often exacerbate gender inequalities. Can you explain how conflict may disproportionately impact women and why this is important in informing the process of transitional justice? Good, good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me on this panel. Uh, Milena, your question is, is really critical, I think, to, to you know, this entire discussion, which is there is clearly a disproportionate impact of conflict on women, and this is you know, something that takes place and emerges in, in multiple fronts and in multiple ways. So one is you have an exacerbation of sexual and gender-based violence inevitably, you have uh, mass place displacement and trafficking that affects women in a unique and different manner as compared to boys and men. Uh, you have a range of human rights violations and it exacerbates discrimination. The inequalities that perhaps al always existed to an extent get magnified and, and you know, get, get, uh, get much more deep also in the, in the process of conflict and post-conflict. I think the other areas that we need to look at also are access to health infrastructure and adverse economic impact and an impact on women in terms of political activity and their role as, as agents of change really. And I think with weakened networks, with weakened community networks, it's, it's critical that women are involved because of this incredible impact that is a, a part of their lived experience in the context of conflict and immediately after conflict. I think in terms of um, the importance of involvement in the processes of transitional justice. Um, you know, I've, I've, as, as Valerie mentioned, UNDP has come out with this really uh, well-informed and well-researched report as well. And it's, it, I think it's important to take a look at some of the research in that report. And I'll just pull out a few aspects that I thought were really uh, were critical to this, this question, which is, at the bare minimum, you've got a normative underpinning. You've got international treaties. You have, uh, you know, the Beijing platform. You've got the agenda for st sustainable development. You have all these norms that exist that are meant to um, ensure women's rights are incorporated in all these processes. Now, Resolution 2467 of 2019 specifically talked about meaningful participation of women in transitional justice processes. And I think when we talk about that, I think we do need to also think of what are the barriers, what are what are the restrictions that might, uh, you know, be in the way of this meaningful participation, and also what is meaningful participation. So I think for that, I think we need to be also quite clear that it's not token participation, it's not, you know, superficial. Um, it should be at all levels, including decision making. Um, it should be in the composition of all transitional justice processes, whether those are truth commissions, whether they are commissions of inquiry, whether they are hybrid, whether they are reparations commissions. These are all areas that we need to see women participate. And I think the one thing that I would like to emphasize, um, and I know our language sometimes doesn't capture this fully, is I think it's critical to move away also from viewing women only as victims or survivors and as agents of political change able to um, advocate for themselves as well. And I think that's a critical part of this. I'll just highlight three quick examples where I think it has made a difference and you've had an influence and change. One is Guatemala, where you had the Sepor Zarco case, where you, know, you had a tribunal of conscience, which eventually led to prosecutions, which then led to women having a key role in determining what reparations would work for them including education, including healthcare. So I think it's critical to have that involvement. The second is the Gambian Truth Commission, which had listening circles and a greater focus on sexual and gender-based violence because of emblematic cases. And the last I'll, I'll refer to is Tunisia and the Truth and Dignity Commission, where mobilization was required to ensure that women's testimony was increased from 5% to nearly 20%, and that this was included in the history that was being written at the commission. So I think just a few examples to emphasize that women need to participate and more effectively in these processes. Thank you so much. Now I see that Jacqueline was able to join us. Jacqueline, welcome. I'm glad that your um, connection is up. You were able to join us. My next question is actually for you. As an experienced lawyer and leader of gender inclusion and transitional justice in South Sudan, 
What are the major challenges to inclusive transitional justice and to women's engagement with these processes? And what do you see as the key issues facing the inclusion of women in transitional justice efforts in South Sudan currently? Uh, thank you very much. I think I lost the last question, but if I can start with the challenges um, in transitional justice, I can say probably justice process is ongoing uh, where we have the Commission for Truth starting with public consultations. And uh, these consultations have been ongoing and women were able to participate in the process. Um, however, in the process of the consultations, we realize a lot of challenges to inclusion. Uh, one of the challenges in terms of the location. So where the public consultations are taking place, uh, most of them are in major uh, towns probably. And if we want to bring victims or people who are affected with the conflict, they live in the peripheries, like more grassroots based uh, communities. And for them to be able to come to the consultations, they require some logistical support. And that means you have to facilitate their coming or uh, their being at the venue for the public consultations. So this has made a majority of the women who are at the grassroots not to be able to attend because they face challenge of uh, mobility. And if we talk of uh, people who are affected, uh, we look at people who probably got injured during the conflict, uh, women who are sexually abused and they fear because of stigma to be seen in public. And this has hindered them from moving from where they are to the public uh, consultations uh, places. Uh, the other issue is that um, until you are able to deliberately invite women groups to come, uh, when you just say we are here to do consultations without mentioning we need women, you need uh, survivors, and particularly survivors of sexual violence in that regard, you'll find that those who come for the consultations, they are mainly of one gender, and uh, few women will be able to come. And we realize that it's important to always set a target group and mention specifically that you need this category to be included and deliberately inviting women directly um, helped to make sure that women are in the process. Um, the other uh, challenge we had was that the questionnaires um, had to be gender sensitive. So for example, if you're asking about the jurisdiction and the mandate of a commission, you need to say uh, the jurisdiction in terms of addressing issues that are pertinent to women and particularly looking at sexual and gender-based violence cases that probably happen during violations and uh, during conflict. And you also need to look at uh, the jurisdiction in terms of their outreach. Uh, how are they going to be looking in terms of the violations that happen, like gross human rights violations, experiences of women and girls in these kinds of violations? Um, the other one in, is in terms of the composition, what should be the composition of uh, the Commission for Truth or for example, the commission of the different mechanisms of transitional justice. Um, gender inclusion is very important. And for us in South Sudan, although we had the requirement that maybe three out of the seven commissioners are going to be women, is specifically it has to be um, stated that at least, but there should be some deliberate action to be able to look for uh, these women to become commissioners. Um, the terms of reference, the vetting process, all has to be gender sensitive so that it doesn't exclude women, even if they are mentioned and then they fail to meet the requirements and they are left out. Um, capturing women's views is very important. You find that sometimes we focus on the bigger issues of the transitional justice mechanisms. And then in the discussions, men tend to keep quiet because like you are talking about political processes and you have to just take a deliberate stand and say, women, we need to have focus group with you. And that's when they'll start opening up and talking about these critical issues. But having blanket uh, kind of consultations will not allow women to give their views concretely on some of these issues. Cultural barriers remain a big issue. 
and especially when you are talking about women experiences in the conflict. Um, they can give you generic, but they will not look at how the conflict affected them at individual levels. So um, having worked also on documentation and uh, uh, documenting stories of women is similar like to documenting the truth processes, for example. And you find that sexual violence victims cannot open up easily. Uh, they will end up telling you about they are being tortured or um, uh, these people just arrested them. But when it comes to actual issues of their experience regarding sexual violence, they shy away simply because cultures cannot allow them to speak about sex sexual issues and their own experiences. Stigma is so high, they cannot come forward to share their experience. And lastly, I'll say trauma is one of the big issues uh, in our experiences. Women, when they speak and recall the losses they had um, in terms of their families, their children, their husbands and relatives that they lost, they break down in the middle. And that requires some proper support in terms of psychosocial support to women who are going to be participating in the transitional justice process. So I think these are some of the key um, uh, challenges, but overall for South Sudan, insecurity remains a bigger issue for women to be able to come and testify. The civic space is itself a, uh, a security issue for them because they fear of reprisals, but also their physical security in terms of coming to where consultations happen uh, make women to shy away from coming to participate. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Um, my next question is for Pinky, following up on Jacqueline's comments. You recently helped author a handbook on gender mainstreaming and transitional justice in the context of South Sudan. What were some of the key takeaways from your research and more specifically, what policy choices could be made during periods of transition in order to, to ensure women's inclusion in transitional justice processes? Thank you, Milena. And it's such a pleasure to be here with you all today and be along with this inspiring group of women. Um, as Milena mentioned, I, I worked on a handbook with uh, PILPG along with some of my colleagues and we identified a number of good practices in the course of our research and, and review of our case studies. Um, and I should preface by noting that, you know, how we define gender mainstreaming will ultimately be informed by a particular community and the gender dynamics and opportunities and, and challenges specific to those communities. Uh, but in terms of our, our generally relevant takeaways, one is uh, the importance of demonstrating an, an evidence base for gender mainstreaming. I think everyone here knows that there is such a strong evidence base that shows the linkages between incorporating women's perspectives and better and more sustainable outcomes. But in places where that isn't a common understanding, it's important that that is communicated. And that's important not just for community support for gender justice programming, but also in order to generate budgetary support and political and, and leadership support. And in places like South Sudan, where a major challenge relates to the shortages of resources to address immense justice sector reform goals, uh, evidence can be used to generate budgetary commitments uh, and also raise awareness and, and change cultural norms and cultural challenges that Jacqueline alluded to. And this can be done through personal appeals to, to colleagues, uh, trainings, billboards. Um, there's some good practices around uh, social media usage as well. Uh, and another uh, kind of key takeaway that uh, I believe both Bria and, and Jacqueline alluded to is the importance of increasing actual representation in, in justice systems. And this can be done through quotas and accountability mechanisms. And in South Sudan, you see the peace agreement does include a quota for women's representation in transitional justice mechanisms. And that of course is important to foster trust and legitimacy in the process. And then of course, women's voices can be used to help uh, document gender dynamics that may have given rise to violence and, and make a recommendations to avoid uh, repeated violence um, from the past. Um, and you know, in, in ensuring women's representation, there needs to be attention paid to procedures and rules for the appointment and promotion of women in decision-making positions. So there should be caution against rules or requirements that may be comparatively difficult um, for women to satisfy for various 
uh, practical and historical reasons. And then, of course, you know, importantly, along with quotas and strict representation, there needs to be meaningful participation. Um, and that needs to be across all levels and sectors and government. And um, participation really needs to reflect a country's diversity and the intersectionality of issues. And so women need to be included across regions and across different um, demographic groups. And in looking at some of the kind of best practices and case studies, one way to ensure meaningful participation uh, and that women's perspectives are included is to have gender focused organizational structures. Uh, and so that can include things like gender focused offices and task force. And they can either be responsible for a broad range of gender issues or they can focus on a discrete uh, specific issue. Um, another way to address women's barriers is uh, through official rules or procedures of a decision making body. And that could include um, administrative and procedural uh, conventions for proceedings that take into account particular constraints women face, whether they're uh, financial or, or time-based. Um, meetings should also be open to civil society and the, and the public in order to be transparent and accountable. And they can also um, increase accountability and awareness through uh, reporting on various forms of media and in multiple languages. And last thing I'll note in addressing barriers to women's effective and meaningful participation is education and the importance of education to overcome some of the structural barriers and historical discrimination that women face. Um, and to that end, women need to be given the tools to effectively participate in negotiations and in government and in the economy. And that can be done through skills building and other educational uh, tools. And here, you know, international groups as well as local NGOs can play a big role in training and educating women on things like negotiation skills uh, and public speaking and advocacy. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to uh, Milena. Thank you so much, Pinky. Now, my next question is for Katerina. Katerina, as we heard earlier, sexual and gender-based violence can increase during times of conflict and can often be used as a weapon of war. We're all following the events in Ukraine and the sexual crimes being committed there. How must sexual and gender-based crimes inform transitional justice mechanisms, and how must these mechanisms take these victims' needs into consideration when pursuing true justice, reconciliation, as well as institutional reform? Um, good morning or good afternoon, colleagues, and thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for your question, Milena. Uh, in answering to that, um, I will try to refer as much as possible to the context that you have just mentioned, to the Russia-Ukraine conflict, but actually the findings that I have seen in this context as a scholar and as a practitioner does confirm the uh, major tendencies concerning the impact of conflict-related sexual violence and the participation of survivors in transitional justice process, processes around the globe. So, so the two principal takeaways are that um, when more visibility is accorded to the issue of conflict-related sexual violence, uh, first, uh, there is more recognition that survivors include not only women, but also men and non-binary people, because oftentimes, and Ukraine is not exception, there is this presumption that it's usually women who are victims of sexual violence. Um, and second, um, the larger debate about sexual violence in war allows to expand its understanding and see that it's not confined to rape, again, as it's usually prevalent perception, but there are other forms of conflict-related sexual violence, such as forced nudity and forced pregnancy, and the particular also forms of genocidal intent in certain forms of sexual abuse. Um, where does it take us with the survivors? I fully agree with the previous uh, speakers who said that uh, it's very important to help the survivors, women, but the survivors uh, of conflict-related sexual violence in general, to feel not just as victims, but as the active contributors 
to uh, transitional justice policy making, to the accountability and justice in their wider understanding, and wider to the to building the resilient uh, state governance. Uh, where has this led us in the context of Ukraine? Uh, Ukraine has been over-focused on courtroom accountability, but even in this narrow approach to justice, conflict-related sexual violence has not been prioritized, was not prioritized in the first eight years of Russia's aggression before the full-scale invasion um, this year. Uh, there was only the first communication to the ICC being developed on conflict-related sexual violence. There were just three domestic prosecutions of related cases, and they mostly looked at conflict-related sexual violence uh, through the lenses of torture. And survivors, most importantly, did not receive reparations and did not receive the specific reparations which women, men, or uh, the elderly uh, groups of survivors might need. Um, this has changed now with the more uh, attention to the escalated and new forms of sexual violence in Ukraine. Um, namely, uh, the survivors are engaged in uh, the policy making. They're, uh, they're advising the government as to what their needs would be and what their preferences would be in terms of reparations. And the women do have a very particular voice there because um, it has been evident in practice that they are more ready to voice their needs. They're more ready to speak about the nuances of the victimization that affect not just them, the individual uh, survivor, but their family and their wider social unit. They would be the first to say that uh, there needs to be uh, the um, couple counseling which should be supported by states or by donor organizations. So I would like to point out that women would really open up the eyes of the most good willing uh, policy makers and human rights groups into their needs. Uh, as regards the truth-telling uh, initiatives, it's also, and as well as um, um, criminal accountability, uh, whereas there is oftentimes much good willingness and support, it's important to stress that these processes should be very sensitive to this particular group of survivors, and they should pursue the best practices of the do no harm principles of documentation um, and the wider processes. And in this regard, the recently released uh, Murat Code and the International Protocol for the Documentation and Investigation of Sexual Violence in Conflict are a very good guidance. Um, and finally, when we speak about institutional reform and prevention, uh, there is no way these uh, streams can be sustainable and informed without the meaningful participation of survivors uh, in their design. So for instance, um, during the earlier stages of Russia's invasion in 2020 and 2021, um, the Ukrainian government together with the UN women understood that um, helping uh, the survivors of conflict-related sexual violence is not just about reacting uh, and prosecutions, it's about prevention. And they initiated the development of a holistic matrix uh, on the prevention and response to conflict-related sexual violence. And why that was so important? Because uh, they tried to look holistically into the um, uh, different sectors of uh, the state and social organization and see where the threats of sexual violence might come from. What additional reform, what additional trainings are needed for the military to make it more sensitized to the treatment of women in the military, but also to make them more sensitized to the comfort of the civilians they might be around in an event of an armed conflict. In a similar way, more guidance was developed for the Ministry of Social Affairs to really focus on the specific reparations 
to the individual victims of human rights violations in Ukraine, but also pointing that the needs of these victims do differ, but understandably depending on the types of the victimization. And while the mentioned, may unfortunately due to the understandable circumstances of the recent full-scale invasion of Russia into Ukraine, um, I think it was still a very positive indicator that Ukraine as a state, but more importantly as a society, started to move from reactive to preemptive policy making. And it also understood that this policy making will not be sustainable without the meaningful participation of survivors who should participate not just in the implementation of the policies, but initially in their design. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Katerina. Um, my next question is for Patty. Patty, we've spoken about some domestic opportunities to improve the responsiveness of transitional justice to women's perspectives and participation. But as someone who has worked for more than one international tribunal, what role do international courts and international actors have in ensuring gender inclusive justice and how have some of these crimes been addressed by the ICC, as well as by some of the other international criminal tribunals? Well, thank you very much, Milena, for the question. And I'd like to uh, bring some broad strokes that encompass some of the presentations of the uh, previous speakers because the international courts and tribunals, and one could move from Yugoslavia to Rwanda to the special court for Sierra Leone for the extraordinary criminal tribunals of Cambodia into the international criminal court, also with East Timor, and see that there have been some very stark lessons. Uh, in the beginning, many of them centered around questions of sexual violence, in particular rape. And then those questions and those types of crimes actually expanded, not just in looking at sexual violence as a form of torture, but understanding that sexual violence and then gender-based violence was a way to attack the civilian population. Also, I think the different courts and tribunals have given us a manner in which to understand a concept that is really fundamental to what we're discussing today, and that's contextualization. Instead of saying, well, we have to add concerns of women in, our presumption should be that there is no way not to understand either the genocide, the crimes against humanity, or the war crimes without understanding what occurred to women, to girls, and to men, and to boys, and non-binary people. The presumption is that it is so integral to understanding it that to do any less is really not to look at the full scope of the genocide for the attack against the civilian population, or even I would add the aggression that could be committed and certainly the war crimes. And so I think what the international courts and tribunals have really given us if we step back is to have absolutely shifted a presumption of the errant soldier of the one-off bad apple to understand that we're talking about different types of policies, different types of structures, and as importantly, we're talking about the gender composition of the targeted group of the civilian population, of the protected group. So today that when we see people fleeing um, the Ukraine, it is almost ludicrous to say the civilian population, including women and children. The majority of that fleeing population is women, are females and children. And we could say the same thing when we look at other populations fleeing, such as the Rohingya. The surviving population, that civilian population, that we are really um, bound to erga amis use cohesion obligations to protect via accountability, and I would add to a transitional justice, is in many ways a female population or a female majority population. So this ideal of meaningful participation is if that will add something to the process, I'd really like to flip it to say that without meaningful participation, there really is a defective process per se. I think the courts and tribunals have also given us a different way to understand that transitional justice happens in many phases and that accountability via a justice mechanism is only one of the phases. And it's usually a phase that does not come at the beginning of genocide or armed conflict or crimes against humanity. It might occur during them, but usually it occurs at least midway through or if not to the end. By the time a mechanism is set up, 
that it's not the uh, standing international uh, criminal court or if the state party hasn't joined the criminal court. So we're really talking about accountability via justice is never being the first approach to transitional justice. It might be among the middle approaches and certainly toward the end. But due to that, it means that we have to recognize what is the position and status of women and girls going into human rights violations, going into international crimes, and not just in their midst and as they're coming out of it. What I think that the international courts and tribunals have also given us is understanding the gendered nature of every underlying provision of crimes against humanity, of genocide and war crimes. So as I've said before, we could look at deportation, but we could look at transfer of children to another group as a provision of genocide and understanding that transfer of children, such as in Seposaku, had to do with the Maya Ishil children being transferred out of their group, boys and girls. So the very gendered nature of the different provisions of the international crimes, this informs us of what transitional justice should actually encompass as we're trying to put a society, not necessarily back together, but actually in a gender better situation than it was than when it dissolved. And the reason for this, I believe, is that the transitional justice from a gender perspective is really to dismantle the pervasive prejudicial gender structures that led to some of the human rights violations and the destruction, or at least sustain them to a certain extent, or were used by the perpetrators. So women's participation or female participation in transitional justice to be meaningful is to reconstruct and to remake society in a means that is less discriminatory toward women and particularly and toward gender, not only in general. One of the issues that I would like to bring up is that we can see in Syria by the killing of the LGBTIQ community by ISIS, those were gender-based crimes. And they were gender-based crimes that might've been related to sexual orientation, but they were crimes of killing because they were trying to restructure the ISIS society to eliminate a gender minority of the LGBTIQ. So this is what transitional justice has to respond to and has to restructure in a more positive way. The other example I'd wanna give is the fact that we're talking in many ways, almost as if we've lost hope in terms of females in Afghanistan, in particularly girls and the lack of education. The fact that there were not significant numbers of women at the peace talks and that the peace talks involved more than just issues of the destruction of property, but the elimination of human rights as is a right to an education for girl children means that the society that is transiting, that should be reconstructed, has a visible gap within it. So I think the international courts and tribunals, if we step back and look at the broader conversations that they have raised, have allowed us to look at the very gendered nature of the crimes, of the different provisions, and of the need of what would be in the transited society, one that has transformed itself and one whose structures now support the viability of women and girls and other gender and gender minorities. Thank you, Patty. Um, following up on this theme of the role of international courts, my next question is for Valerie. Valerie is someone whose research largely focuses on um, how sexual and gender-based crimes have been prosecuted by various um, international courts and tribunals. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And if you think um, if you think that the international criminal justice system can be improved in order to hold more perpetrators accountable for sexual and gender-based crimes. Thank you very much. And I'm going to build completely on the remarks that were just made by Patty because they're as usual, so amazing. Um, Patty mentioned that sexual and gender-based crimes have been addressed by almost all modern day international or internationalized courts. She mentioned the Yugoslav and Rwanda tribunals, the Cambodia tribunal, the Sierra Leone tribunal, and of course the International Criminal Court as examples. And within these, there have been ups and downs along the way with sexual and gender-based crimes being successfully prosecuted in ways that are survivor-centered and gender-sensitive in many cases. And then in other cases, sexual and gender-based crimes being completely overlooked or dismissed or improperly analyzed. And I'm going to give you two short examples. 
First, I'll give you the example, a positive example from the International Criminal Court. And that is in the case of prosecutor and Dominic Anguen. And in that case, which stems from the Uganda situation, the trial chamber found Anguen guilty last year in 2021 of 61 charges of crimes against humanity and war crimes, many of which, a larger number of which were charges of sexual and gender-based violence committed in Northern Uganda between 2002 and 2005. He was convicted of two types of sexual and gender-based violence, um, crimes that he carried out himself, and then also crimes that were carried out by individuals under his command as part of a plan. And within this, what is so um, really forward thinking about the prosecutor's office in that case is that the sexual and gender-based crimes were conceptualized within the um, case theory so that it was just centrally implicated so that when there were discussions and um, convictions for forced marriage, torture, rape, sexual slavery, enslavement, forced pregnancy, and outrages upon personal dignity, all of these were conceptualized in a way that was gender sensitive and gender competent. And this conviction as a result was a historic turn for the International Criminal Court, which had a relatively dismal record prior to this, apart from one other case, regarding sexual and gender-based violence charges. So against that positive example, I want to give a negative example. And this is from the Special Court for Sierra Leone in a case called the Civil Defense Forces case. Now, in that case, girls and women who had experienced conflict-related sexual violence were willing to speak to special court investigators once they had grown to trust those investigators. But building that trust took time. These girls and women had been victimized by their own community, the community in which they still live for the most part. So they risked ostracism and physical and other retaliation from within their own community by telling their stories of intimate violations of sexual, what were considered intimate violations, sexual violence um, violations, and revealing what many in the community would consider to be so-called dirty laundry. So it was understandable that it took longer for these girls and women to be able to tell their story to, it took longer for the prosecutor's office to investigate sexual violence in that case longer than it took to invest any, investigate any other crime in that particular case. So what the prosecutor did is file the orig original charges without any sexual violence charges because of some time pressures, and then later requested to amend the charges once the sexual violence evidence was firmed up. And in that case, two of the three judges refused to consider the factors that I just mentioned about the situation, the context of the women and girls as being relevant to the timing of the prosecutor's request for amendment and rejected the amendment's request with the end result that no sexual violence or gender-based violence charges um, were considered and there was no discussion of sexual violence in the judgment at all. So those are two examples of the, these ups and downs that I'm talking about. Now, Milena, you asked me to talk about ways that the international criminal justice system can be improved to be more gender sensitive. And there are, there are many, many different way, ways to improve it from the very first moments the situation of armed conflict or mass atrocity emerges to the investigation, prosecution, trial, and appeals levels and to reparations. So I'm only going to mention two ways. One is I'd like to pick up on Katarina's point about the need for investigations and documentation of conflict-related sexual violence to do no harm and to follow the documents that she had mentioned, the MIRAD code, which was released earlier this year, and the international protocol that she also mentioned. Because right now, and perhaps Katerina can, can speak about this as well, in Ukraine, it, it's quite concerning about the number of, um, individuals and groups that are attempting to document conflict-related sexual violence, um, whether it's from the media or non-governmental groups or accountability mechanisms that 
need to coordinate, but not all of them seem to be following the do no harm principle. So that's worrisome and more improvement can be made in that respect. The other way in which improvements can be made is in judicial recruitment and judicial training of accountability mechanisms. We have uh, many different initiatives with respect to improving the investigation and the prosecution of sexual and gender abuse crimes. But what we often see, unfortunately, is not enough gender competent um, judges and judicial staff analyzing the evidence. And then that can lead to misunderstandings and what I would consider to be incorrect rulings as a result of not having that gender competence within the judges or, with, um, or being gained by the judges as they um, take on their positions. Thank you. Yeah, and Valerie, I'm really glad you're mentioning the judges. Here's an off script, you know, question slash comment. And this is actually for Priya, because I think Priya, you have blogged about this. There's also something to be said about the gender imbalance within the judiciary, right? I think you authored this blog post about basically like where the women and I've written about this too. So can I actually invite you to share a few thoughts on, on that subject? Sure, absolutely. Um... Yeah, I, I think I wrote this blog post in 2018 at the end of end of the year 2018 or 2019, and it was in the context of seeing the nominations for the residual mechanism uh, for the Yugoslav tribunal, which was, I think, a list of 11 men. And to be honest, it, it really just enraged me. And, and I just hammered out that blog post in, in a few hours. And I, you know, for me, it was a serious question to say, where are the women? Because when you're in law school, you're you know, you're, you're litigating, you're practicing as a lawyer, there are women around you. And where do they seem to vanish in the, the upper echelons of the international tribunals or even national judiciaries? So I did a little bit of, of uh, number crunching on the, the sort of the in, intake. And, and I think the statistics say that the, the intake of female students, uh, law students is extremely high, nearly 50-50. And in looking at, so I looked at the courts, I also looked at the special mandate holders, I also looked at the uh, treaty bodies to try to confirm my suspicion that women really seem to be missing. And the statistics were really stark and, and I was aghast at the end of it. And, and you know, when I hit the send button on, on the post, um, it was honestly with quite a heavy heart because if you look at the, and I, and I put it, I, I basically made graphs so that we had a visual picture so that you could see the difference in, in the gender composition of the courts. Some of the regional courts were better, but the International Court of Justice uh, had one of the worst statistics on par with the International Law Commission, which was about, I, I think the, the number now is six women in the last 70 years, and, and it's at its highest composition currently, which is I think five. Um, the International Criminal Court has done a little better. Um, the regional courts, the, the Inter-American Court for Human Rights has done better as well. But overall, it's a bit of an abysmal picture. And I really do feel that there is a need. And in fact, there's a campaign called uh, GQL, which basically is to increase women's participation at these levels as well. So, so yeah, I mean, I think it is a problem, but I think awareness of the problem and starting to work on it is something that's quite critical and that's something that you're doing as well. So uh, I think that's fantastic. Yeah, thank you, Priya. And just, just for our audience, so in the chat, we've put a link to uh, Priya's blog post. Um, and then I would just mention also that I believe that the first ILC, International Law Commission, female member wasn't appointed until about 2001. And the first permanent judge on the International Court of Justice, not until 1995. So that, that is um, pretty staggering. Um, so we have about six minutes left. With that, I wanted to invite um, our remaining panelists for another sort of quick round of thoughts. So uh, Patty, let me, let me go to you next. Based on your experience as both an academic and practitioner in gender and transitional justice, do you have any particular advice to offer to um, you know, sort of the new generation? And I wanna say particularly to the young women entering the field. Yes, I would just like to underscore that we have to understand that we are working for and on behalf of the international community and that survivors, victims, 
of international crimes are part of the international community. This is co-working. These are citizens of countries. These are citizens of the international community. And I really wanna make sure that they are seen in their entire global entity that be individual and their collective, whether their families, their societies, their nations, and that we have to really step away from any indication of the poor little victim or survivor. That is not it. That person is us. We are working with and on behalf of them. That is what I would really like to emphasize people to have as their name motif and say go forward in these very difficult times for transitional justice. Thank you so much. Um, Jacqueline, um, any final thoughts from you about um, including women in transitional justice processes, um, uh, a more holistic approach to transitional justice, anything else you can share, share with us, just being mindful of the time. Uh, we're, we're notorious at the PLPG for ending our roundtables in exactly 60 minutes. So I wanna, I wanna keep that record. So Jacqueline, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much again, Milena. I think one last thing I will say is that we need to have a robust uh, civic education uh, program to create awareness on what is transitional justice, for example. Uh, different countries uh, probably uh, may understand transitional justice different. And in South Sudan, it's like a new concept. So a lot of civic education is required if people have to really participate, be it women, men, and even uh, people uh, who are affected by the conflict. Um, the second uh, issue is that we need to create a conducive environment for people to be able to participate in this process. Talking about transitional justice is very sensitive, especially when you're talking about accountability issues and accountability in the context of conflict situations is very, very difficult. And most of the perpetrators, they are still probably holding on to their guns and they're within the communities. So without conducive environment, and then it becomes difficult to implement transitional justice agenda and also to meet the goal of transitional justice. So that means that we have to uh, struggle for that space. And just uh, taking a quote from one of the survivors is that if you want us to participate in the truth commission in the healing process, you need to stand with us. So uh, standing with uh, uh, victims and survivors is very important. And I think this calls across um, uh, actors, including partners who are supporting transitional justice process, governments who are pursuing the transitional justice mechanisms. They really need to stand behind uh, survivors and people who are affected for them to be able to participate in the process. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pinky. Any last minute thoughts from you? Yeah, so I'll just end by saying, um, you know, I think efforts towards gender mainstreaming will need to be sustained and, and continuous and even progress made is fragile. Um, you know, during the pandemic, there were many reports about how 20 years of gender progress had been lost in uh, 20 weeks. And so in addition to addressing new and continuing challenges, we can't take any progress that is made for granted um, and we'll need to be persistent in our efforts. Thank you, and Katerina, you have the last word. Thank you very much. Um, my last statement would be that the awful situations of armed conflict and aggression could actually be the unlikely catalyst also of change. And uh, from what I have seen in Ukraine, women have joined the armed forces much more. Women have joined the local authorities and also the parliament. And currently there is the highest numbers of females, 20% in the parliament. So the main message in terms of helping the survivors should be that it's not just about helping the victims, it's about empowering them, including women and young women, to be the active co-shapers of the destiny of their country. I hope that, that this spirit remains uh, in Ukraine's transitional justice policy and beyond. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, that's all that we have time for today. Thank you for joining us and submitting your questions. The webinar recording will be available on the PLPG website and shared with all the attendees via email. This event was part of the PLPG Thought Leadership Initiative series. Thank you very much to our panelists for taking the time today to talk about the inclusion of women in transitional justice. I encourage everyone to follow this initiative and join us for our next event on Friday, June 17th, 
at noon Eastern Standard Time on the war in Ukraine and territorial sovereignty. Thank you. Thank you very much.